uh, Dr. Uh, John Fike. Uh, he uh, works uh, for uh, Virginia Tech University. Uh, Dr. Fike received his uh, master's degree in forage agronomy from Virginia Tech and uh, his PhD degree uh, from University of Florida. Uh, he is a professor and an extension uh, specialist and his program focuses on uh, grassland uh, production management, and he's engaged in several efforts to develop new information and educational activities uh, related to uh, animal production, forage production, uh, animal welfare, and ecosystem uh, benefits, uh, including on silver pasture systems, which is uh, what he's going to be talking about today. So uh, his talk is going to focus uh, more on a general uh, overview of uh, the establishment and uh, managing to some, management to some extent of for uh, silver pasture uh, production systems. So without further ado, uh, Dr. Fike, the floor is yours. Thank you, Liliane. I uh, just thinking here, I'm not 100% sure that I have hit the objectives exactly like I should have. And I also uh, hope that I don't step on Bruno's toes uh, or get in his in his lane too much, but, um, but I wanted to give some kind of overview of civil pasture systems. I'm going to give just a, a little bit of history uh, where how I got engaged with this practice, and some I'll give some uh, definition and historical context, um, and then I want to spend a bit of time talking about the resources in these systems and. Um, some of our research results and then kind of how producers are approaching some of this. So without further ado, um, I was engaged to with civil pasture about 20 years ago when this guy on the left, Jim Berger, came to me and said, hey, Mike, you know, I've got this project. We've got these little young trees out here in the system and we're doing this agroforestry practice called civil pasture and I need somebody to do some forages work in there. Would you be interested? And, and I, you know, as a kid off the farm, uh, in my head immediately said, nobody wants trees and pastures. Um, as a, as a young scientist who needed something to do, I said, sure. And so I got engaged with that. And, um, it's been, it's been an interesting ride. Now, part of my perspective is clouded by the fact that a lot of people think about, uh, cows in the woods as civil pasture, they get that confused. Civil pasture is not cows in the woods and it's not a lone tree in a pasture. Um, so, you know, try to set our boundaries here in terms of defining what civil pasture is. It's a sustainable land management practice that's integrating intensive animal husbandry, silviculture, and forage management, where the trees can provide some kind of long-term return and the livestock grazing can generate an annual income. And in some circles, we talk about this in context of a four I principle. So we're doing this intentionally. We're not just dumping cows in the woods with a boundary. It's integrated. So I'm thinking about how do trees and uh, livestock, how can I manage those together? It's intensive. And if there's one fundamental piece that applies to civil pasture systems, whether you're in Vermont or Virginia or uh, in, in Brazil or other places, if it's going to be done well, you have to apply management. Uh, and then, you know, how do these pieces interact? So one of my conceptions, uh, again, you know, nobody wants trees and pastures, but, you know, what's my conception based on? It's based on being able to go to the local feed and seed store and buy fence posts and supplements and nitrogen fertilizer and whatever else. Um, but these systems probably were pretty common or somewhat common, at least in the Appalachian region, um, you know, prior to those kinds of um, markets and, and, you know, changes in our economy. Uh, and why would that be? I mean, if I had a tree that could put nitrogen into the system and support the understory forage, it provided shade, kept my livestock comfortable. And it might be a source of fuel or posts, um, building materials, uh, something like a black locust tree. Uh, that would be fantastic. Or, you know, black walnuts, something that could provide feed resource for the family or for the pigs or whatever. So these systems aren't new. We just kind of marched away from them as our economy and other opportunities for, for building systems changed. And there's some early literature that shows greater productivity 
with forages under different tree species. And this is some data out of the 50s out of Arkansas, and they were looking at animal performance um, and saw that cows had better gain under natural shade. Calves, shade source didn't really matter that much, but calves gained more uh, when they had a source of shade. And one of the interesting pieces here is that it's, it's not so much, you know, more grazing time, it's changes in behavior. Um, and I'll, I'll come back to that a little bit later. So when we think about these systems, we need to think about what are the resources and how do we manage that? Because that's what this is all about. It's managing resources. Well, you've got light, moisture, soil nutrients, opportunity for nutrient returns. And um, if, that, if you look at the picture on the right, you'll see temporal partitioning. So sometimes one thing is growing when something else is not. Uh, and they, you know, the tree may have access to deeper soil nutrients than the grass can. Uh, get to that term exclusive access probably means really something like excluding access where the tree can prevent the grass root from getting to those nutrients. So there's there's some of those kinds of dynamics that go on in these systems as well. And how do we manage that? Um, one of the other features that, you know, <clears throat> that's inherent in these systems is that there can be competition. And, and I sort of alluded to that with the previous slide. So in the, you know, as, a, as an academic, I got to throw a little jargon at you. So thinking about competitive partitioning, that's where you've got two crops that are competing for the same resources. But the interesting thing is that when I've got these different crops competing for these resources, the use efficiency can go up and it will be greater than if I just have a single species. And so again, in a civil pastoral context, I'm trying to manage the competitive interactions so that even if I have some negative effects, you know, from one species to the other, across the whole, I've got a more productive system. And that's really, uh, you know, I think that we can do better than that. And I'll show you some of our data that would suggest that. So I, I want to kind of hit one comment or a concept called land equivalency ratio. And so if you look at the system, the light blue bars are forages. And the dark blue bars are cattle. I didn't put one in here for trees in an open system, but you could imagine having a, a forested system, uh, you know, plantation forest as well. And, and so in an open system where I don't have trees, I can get 100% of my forage yield, is going to give me 100% of my cattle yield. And so that land equivalency ratio is 100%, or we just say it's one. Um, if I put a silo pasture in, I might take 20 or even more percent reduction in forage yield. Doesn't sound too good, does it? Well, but you know, maybe, I, and maybe I, I lose a little bit of cattle and that's not too good, right? But I'm 90% on this, on this graphic. Uh, and I can't get 100% of the trees. I didn't plant this wall-to-wall -wall trees, but when I put those pieces together, I've got a tree crop in addition to a cattle crop. And so the land equivalency ratio in this example is 1.2 or 120%. So it's more than what I would get with just trees or just cattle alone. And then the question gets to be, is it worth making these kind of management um, adjustments to be able to do all that? There are some data, this land equivalency ratio or overyielding is another way to describe it. Uh, people look at forage yield response when I start integrating trees. And, and sometimes if I'm based on forages, I can get 50% more yield. If I, it's, if it's based on livestock, you know, maybe about 40% more yield. So 1.4 uh, LER. And this is some work that was done by a former student of mine looking across the literature. And that's what the literature tells us. We integrate trees with pasture systems. We can get greater productivity than we've just the pasture system on its own. So again, thinking about resources. Uh, we, first one would, you know, most people would think about would be light. And with cool season forages, the, the leaves are light saturated on an individual leaf basis at probably 50% full sun. So when you put that in a canopy, uh, they need more sunlight. Light saturation is probably in the 60 to 70% full sun range. That means there's extra light that's not gonna be utilized by just the forage stand. So if I can grow trees in combination with that, that's a good thing. Um, another thing, when you put a tree into the system, that light doesn't just impinge directly from the sun 
to the canopy. It's going to bounce around through the tree leaves. And as it bounces around and changes direction, that creates diffuse light. And that diffuse light uh, is absorbed or used with greater efficiency. Um, and then there's, you know, again, the quality and the quantity and the timing of light that's affected by the types of trees that you have. So I put up these fancy uh, tree cartoons to give you an estimate and you know, an idea of like a, of a pine or a um, something like a maple or an oak in the middle or maybe something like a walnut on the on the right, which has a kind of a more open canopy, may have more uh, compound leaves that allow more light in. And in my context, we often talk about cool season and warm season grasses. We can also get trees that act sort of like a warm season tree in the sense in that they don't leaf out until later and they might drop leaves earlier. So if you consider the yellow line, the warm season tree, uh, if I've integrated that type of tree into the system, uh, I can uh, reduce the competition for light early in the season when the cool season grasses are growing rapidly. And then I can drop off those leaves in the fall when those cool season grasses are picking up production again. So I can try to find ways to complement trees and forages. Now, you know, this is for South Carolina. You may not want to fool with hardwood trees. Uh, so we have to think about different dynamics for managing, say, something with pine. I want to show you again sort of our cool season forage yield response to shade. This is some work that was done in Virginia. So again, a little different environment. And we were looking at complex mixtures of cool season forages. And what you'll see this, uh, the top line on the left uh, figure shows the production in 2016. Uh, so that this is annual, that's not annual forages, that's just over the entire year. And the second line is 2015. So these were newly established and we imposed different shade treatments. And what you find is in this kind of general region of 30 to 40% shade, we have higher productivity or similar productivity to a, a spot with no shade. And what was interesting, uh, if you look on the right graphic, you can see that this, this in a new planting, uh, at that open shade, or, or excuse me, no shade, open sun site, you know, about 70% of the composition there was in weeds. So actually having shade actually benefited the establishment of these forages in year one. So there, there's some real potential value in having shade in the system for the forages. Uh, we did some looking at soil temperature in some of the early studies that we uh, did with trees. And what you'll find is that when you have sort of moderate level of shade, you cool that environment down. And if you look at the, there are three lines here. Um, the, the red top line is the low shade environment and you can see the soil temperatures are highest there. And then you have kind of a green, it's a little bit harder to see. Uh, soil temperatures are lower under that highest level of shade, which, okay, that, that seems sensible. Um, and then the pink line represents kind of what's optimal or ideal for cool season forages. Um, just as an example, uh, for some of the benefit here, Buren Lanier is over in the Wilmington area, has a pine-based silvopasture. He has changed his forage base um, to I think Bahia grass at this point in that silver pasture, but historically he grew fescue. And he said, I could not grow fescue in this environment without those trees. Um, it's, it's just a function of the trees buffering the system. A lot of people say, what about moisture? I said, well, the data kind of depend, it kind of depends on the environmental conditions. If you have a really dry period, um, if it's excessive, the tree and the grass may be competing but if it's moderately dry, oftentimes the trees will help keep moisture in the system by shading and reducing evapotranspiration. So it's kind of an it depends scenario. And that's also dependent on species and that sort of thing. So, you know, it's so, okay, this is all well and good fight, but what's it mean productivity wise? These trees from this study in 2002, when it was extremely dry, that was about, they were seven years old. In 2003, we had an extremely wet year. And you can see the, the size of these are kind of young honey locust trees. We were looking at different tree density and slope position. And what we found was with honey locust and black walnut, uh, two year average, we had about 15 to 16% greater forage production under those kind of moderately spaced trees. 
So, you know, that was uh, really what got me intrigued by these systems. And, well, we can increase productivity of the understory forage. Was, that's fantastic. Well, let's jump ahead to, oh, whatever this was, let's say 2020 or something. These are, um, at this point, about 19-year-old honey locust trees on your left and uh, black walnut on your right. So the trees are much larger. They're casting much more shade. They're competing for more nutrients and that sort of thing. And what we found is this is an average of three years of study, or actually it's not an average, it shows you three years of study. Uh, the black walnut uh, bars in the black uh, had lower forage production. Uh, systems with honey locust had equal production or even a little bit greater. So those trees were not as large. They may actually be putting other nutrients back into the system. So it's a benefit for the forage understory with the honey locust trees. Um, so I said, well, that's terrible. You know, you lost out on that black walnut. Um, and maybe we'll get to that. We do see changes in forage composition under these trees. And with the black walnut, it's not all, it's not all um, uh, milk and cookies, as it were. It's not all beautiful. But we do see some reduction in uh, tall fescue, which it would be infected. And uh, we do see some increase in bluegrass, which is highly nutritious. But you say, well, you tanked your red clover. But, you know, these are some of the things that are going to happen in these systems over time. Now, what does that mean for animal performance? If you look across the systems, we have to lower the stocking rate for that lower forage uh, amount in the black walnut systems. And what we see is that average daily gain across time is as good or better um, in those kind of equalized, they're kind of equalized by available forage. And we look at total animal output for all of these systems, and these are summer grazing studies, we see total output is comparable across these three different systems. And what's going on there? Uh, I, I like to use the analogy, if, if I were giving you a buffet, and I said you can have 100% of the all-you-can-eat buffet outside in the full sun when it's 90 degrees, or I'll give you 70% of the all you can eat buffet, but you can eat inside. Um, where do you think you're going to choose to go? And in which set of conditions or environments do you think you're more likely to gain weight? So what happens is those animals that have access to shade are going to utilize it. You see the black and the yellow dots, much greater shade utilization. There's a little bit of shade that comes into the open pasture system. The black Walnut animals did graze a little bit more because forages are a little bit more limiting. But what's really interesting here is that those animals, like those earlier studies, they're changing their time budget. They spend more time resting. They're lying down more. They're standing less. And that spares energy. And we also have data that shows, you know, animals that are on these silver pastures. If you look at the, uh, the graph on the right, the top line is body temperature through the day of animals on open systems, and they're much warmer uh, through the day. You know, that's, uh, let's say, we'll call that about a degree and a half uh, or more of centigrade. So, you know, two or three degrees or more warmer, hotter than the animals in the silver pasture systems. And the lower table is a little hard to see, but we are uh, measuring cortisol in those animals as well. And the animals that are out in the silver pastures, uh, have lower cortisol levels, meaning they're less stressed. And if you've got tall fescue, you know, shade is critical for, for animals in those systems. And this is just a, a picture of animals that were on non-toxic fescue versus toxic fescue uh, on a mild summer day, probably low 80s in Virginia. And in our animals, so we, we're spending a lot of time on environmental issues, trying to keep cattle out of streams, and I think it's really driven by animals consuming toxic fescue. So these are data from Missouri that, that point to the value of shade for cattle. And it's very interesting. If you look at the first two lines, you've got infected fescue without shade or with shade. And to go from no shade to shade, these were, they put pregnant animals out on these systems. You, um, you went from 38% calving to 88% calving. That's not changing the toxins. That's just providing respite, you know, relief from the, uh, the heat for those cattle. 
And you say, well, this isn't real world fight. And I say, well, this is correct. This is a research study, but this points to what our producers do. They let our, their cattle have access to streams or woodlands. They get shade and they have higher reproductive performance. What's really intriguing to me is that the calf crop is greater with adding shade on toxic fescue than it is on just having cows on non-toxic fescue with no shade. And of course, when you look at calf performance, uh, as you add shade into these systems and move to non-toxic fescue, you get a greater calf performance. So, you know, this is placing us, we're in Virginia, um, in blue outline here, you're down in South Carolina, most of you. I keep telling people South Carolina is coming to us. Um, these are what we're seeing in terms of changes in climate patterns or, or temperatures. Um, and if you, this is a, this is climate central did some analysis and, you know, parts of Virginia have 30 to 60 more growing days in, in our neck of the woods since 1970. Um, you know, there are some estimates, there's some models out there that say where, you know, where we're coming from, from Charleston, this is Charleston, West Virginia. I was giving this talk to some people uh, a while back, you know, in 60 years, it might feel like you live in Mississippi or I guess this is Alabama in this case. So, if we don't address these issues, we're, we're gonna have some real challenges. The question gets back to, do people want trees in pastures? And, and I would argue that, yeah, maybe, maybe not, but many of them want shade. And I would argue that planting trees that can appreciate in value would be far better than spending a lot of money on portable shade systems that are quite expensive and are going to depreciate. So I'm going to show you a few examples of what producers are doing in Virginia uh, and their motivations. So this uh, farmer in the middle is uh, thinning individual trees to create silvopasture, and he's largely doing it for heat stress abatement as well as timber management. This is another producer's approach. He cut out wide bands, wide alleys out of an existing pine stand um, and then create Got, got that cleaned up and got his uh, fescue stand in between there and uh, said his cattle do quite well in that environment during the summertime. So this is kind of Southern Piedmont. This guy uh, did some thinning of hardwood stands and I call it successful failure because you can see the trees, uh, he over thinned and they've experienced some stress and you can see that in this, this picture. But then he went back another time and worked with a consulting forester, conducted a successful timber sale, and has gotten some greater management uh, in this place to establish silver pasture. Um, many of you may have people who have access to pine plantations. This is a former student who created his own silver pasture. He didn't have a lot of money, uh, so what he would do is go in and do uh, select thinning on his own. Uh, he had portable fencing systems. He would put goats in there. They were eating the invasives that were in that pine stand. He broadcast seed and would and would use uh, strategic use of fire and was getting a forage understory underneath that. And because he had the opportunity for sort of long rotations, he never had uh, parasite issues or that sort of thing. And so he's looking at this from a production standpoint, from an environmental restoration standpoint, and of course he, he liked it as part of his fitness plan. Um, Buck Holsinger is up in the Valley of Virginia, and he's planted with tubes, and um, uh, he, he says, you know, I'm looking for two-story agriculture. I was listening to Buck talk earlier this week. He said, I used to think I was a grass farmer. I thought I, thought I was a cow farmer, then I thought I was a grass farmer. He said, now I think I'm a tree farmer, and I'm using the trees to protect and buffer the forages with, and also to protect and buffer the cattle. And, you know, as a, from a marketing perspective, he says, my customers get it because he's direct selling uh, his stuff. And I, I think I have some other pictures from his place in just a little bit. Uh, well, here's one. Uh, this is how Buck approached. He's got an odd piece of ground. He said, I sat down at a table with farm map and I just started thinking, what will I do with this? How will I put these in place? And he started laying it out. And uh, then he came back and said what trees he wanted. And this is the map that he gave to the custom contractors who put the system in place for him. Um, Mr. Milton Napier here on your left, the top left picture. 
he's been doing this because he's thinking about this as a second career and an opportunity for intergenerational land transfer. He's trying to improve the value of his land uh, to pass on to his heirs. Um, other people have more resources and think about this is something to do for hunting or for beef. This is a twin row loblolly pine system in Southern Virginia. Um, others are all about the aesthetics. Uh, I've had one producer tell me that he rents some property on um, uh, or rents, rents some housing on his property. And he says, I'm sure that I get higher rental rates for that just because of the beauty of the silver pastures that they drive past. Um, others people are going to be looking for something different. And this engineer was one of those. Uh, this is some of how he laid it out and some of what's going on in his site now. Black locusts have done quite well. Again, he's a little, we, we have fewer pro people probably working with hardwoods, but, but there are more and more of them that are doing that. Um, species diversity, community engagement, wetland protection for Dana Beagle here, somebody in Southwest Virginia. Now, I wanna throw out an idea. While a lot of the work that I'm doing is trying to get people to plant trees and systems and manage for that, I wanted to throw out an idea about reclamation. Uh, one of my colleagues says silvopasture is a gateway drug uh, in that uh, I can get people engaged uh, with silvopasture and then they can start thinking about forest management. This is a site from New York, uh, extension forester, a guy named Brett Chedzoy. He has silvopastures in New York uh, on his home family farm and in Argentina on his wife's farm there. Um, what Brett did is his, this is what our farm looked like in 2004. So if you've got people uh, that you work with, or you know, if you've got land you have access to that's full of invasive species, and there's a lot of questions about what about regeneration in these systems, you have cattle introduced into these systems, that's gonna be a problem. Look, there's no regeneration here that's of any value, right? Let's, let's, be, let's be honest about that. It's full of invasive species. So, you know, this is Brett's comment. Keep the livestock out of the woods so they don't eat the regeneration. Really? You know, come on. So uh, what he did was he brought in a forest mulcher and cleaned out a bunch of the junk and got seed in, back into the environment and brought his cattle back in. And at this point, this was four years after he did that. He had a lot of uh, black locust trees and maybe some other species as well. The black locusts are quite valuable to him as you know a pole or post crop that he can sell. And he, this is another image. Uh, sorry about that. Adjacent plantation, head high with invasives before he started grazing. So we can use animals as tools. We can use other tools to clean up some of these sites that are degraded and make better value from them. Now, probably the kind of last piece I should really speak to here, and I, I said this earlier, the one fundamental piece about silvopastures, because they it's very difficult to be prescriptive because of the different environments, the different tree species that are adapted to those environments, the different livestock species, livestock classes. I got pictures from Alabama, a guy sent me, forester, conservation specialist, had a bull walking down. It was probably at least four inch diameter pine tree. You know, just want to scratch his belly and testicles. And, you know, that's kind of a hard thing to do for a tree uh, to tolerate. So a calf's not going to do that. Mama cow's not going to do that. So we have to think about, again, all of the components of the system and how do I manage them? And what are their interactions likely to be? And so this uh, person from Mississippi was saying intensive management is key to the system. And so, you know, when we go to work with producers, if they're not already using rotational grazing methods, we're going to have to spend time talking to them about, you know, getting, getting them up to speed with something like that before we start talking about, you know, adding trees into the system. Um, and that, that said, some of these, uh, approaches don't have to be that challenging, perhaps. Again, um, this, this is an example of some pine trees we had at a research station where we had young, we had stalkers in with them, and they did a little bit of damage to the trees, but nothing life-threatening, and um, over time that stand will be just fine. 
if we had bulls or you know, large animals might be a different story. And so, you know, thinking about these dynamics is important, but, you know, it may be worth just sticking the trees in the ground and managing without a whole lot of protection in this context, rather than putting in a lot of uh, fencing and having to work with that to protect the trees. Um, hardwood trees are a little more particular and I think are a little more demanding perhaps in terms of protection. And you'll see a lot of people that use tubes. Um, I mentioned Buck Holsinger earlier. Buck says, I don't want to fool with tubes anymore. I'll just kind of let weeds grow up and protect them. The cows don't seem to bother them as much with some of the weeds and stuff around them. But, you know, some people don't want to fool with that. This producer doing something very interesting. She uses a six foot tube with a fiberglass stake. And then she puts a hot wire across the tube so the cows can actually run or walk underneath this uh, hot line. And if she wants to use it as a fence, she can lower it down on the tube. So she's integrated the tree protection with the fencing. And because she has a hot wire that runs down the tube, they don't push on that, use it as a scratching post or that sort of thing. I would encourage you, I should have uh, included some examples from Georgia and Alabama. I would encourage you to take a picture of this um, uh, web link. Uh, you can also find it on our uh, Virginia Tech Civil Pasture page. But if you go to this web link, you'll find something like 13 different producer stories of people doing civil pasture in Virginia, Carolina, uh, Georgia, Alabama, Tennessee. And this is, you know, uh, these are images that come out of the uh, the video for Wynn Miller there in Tennessee. Um, and it, it, there's also a couple of additional videos that just talk about some of the producer challenges and some of the benefits that the producers are seeing. Uh, a number of people, I mentioned climate earlier in terms of temperature, a number of people, uh, organizations are seeing civil pastures as a way to, um, in effect, offer a natural climate solution for uh, climate change issues, you know, drawing down carbon. There's a project or a group of people that call themselves Project Drawdown. And among the you know, agricultural systems that can be deployed and you know, management practices that can be deployed to improve carbon or remove carbon from the atmosphere, civil pastures considered one of the best. And so there are a number of entities out there that are now working on these systems. And that's all I got. I'll stop there for questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Fike. Uh, so right now we are open for questions. Uh, I'm just going to start with a couple uh, that came uh, while you were presenting, uh, Dr. Okay. Fike. So uh, while you're talking about in one of your slides, you had some black walnut there. So yep. uh, Mrs. Mr. Franklin is asking, uh, black walnut has allopatic uh, properties. Is that a factor in the difference in forest production that you saw on your study? It's really hard for us to tease that out. Um, it, because, it, well, it's, it's, it's hard to tease that out. When you start looking at allelopathy, it takes a lot of um, science is deeper than what I do to, to, to discern that. The question that's been in my mind is, do we see this as an allelopathic effect or is it a shade effect? The walnut trees are larger. They have a denser canopy. If you, um, if you ever read Dr. Seuss, uh, he talks about the truffula tree. Uh, you know, if you know what a truffula tree is, I mean, they look like big pom-poms on, on stems sometimes. Uh, I mean, they're, as they, that's after we prune them, as they're growing out, they're getting bigger, uh, more wider canopy, you know, they're just casting more shade. So it could be uh, somewhat of an allelopathic effect. It could be the shade effect. I tend to think um, it's a little bit of both. And my, my hypothesis would be that the allelopathy it's not stopping us from having clover. In fact, we can see a fair amount of clover in these systems, but it probably slows the clover productivity down, as as does the shade, quite frankly. And with less productive legumes, we have less nitrogen in the system, which means that our cool season forages are less productive. We're not doing, you know, sort of differential uh, fertilization from one system to another. Uh, trying to keep all of that 
the same. And so, you know, we, I just think that our uh, forages are not quite as productive in the system because in part because the legumes are are less productive. Um, so look, there's one other comment I was going to make relative to that. But well, one thing that I would say is with the walnut system, you know, we can we can manage around that. We could have lower density walnuts or we might intersperse, say, black locust that's uh, got a smaller crown and it's going to put nitrogen back into the system. So there's an opportunity to have more diverse systems from the tree perspective. But when these studies were established 30 years ago, almost, you know, they just did a single species in each each system. OK, thank you. So uh, one other question that we have on the chat. So uh, Mrs. Uh, Hobbitson is asking, uh, she's sort of like building up uh, building upon uh, the previous question. So black lo locust is a legume. So do you think this helps with forage production, sort of uh, what you're uh, talking about? Yeah, in fact, I probably should have shown you some other slides. Um, I do think that it adds nitrogen into the system and some of those earlier uh, studies that I pointed to uh, would indicate that as well. Uh, but I would say black locust, uh, particularly, it can also serve as a forage resource. Um, I have some images in some other presentations I didn't include today from uh, the Holsinger farm. And he does what's called a hinge cut. Because he wants a he wants a nice straight tree. Well, if it's got a branch here, he'll cut the top, and that branch will fall down. But it won't break all that cambium uh, layer away from the bark, and so he can still get nutrients out to the leaf tissue. And over a summer, his cows will browse that a couple of times, and then you know when when that finally is done, he'll just cut that that uh, limb off. And these are small diameters, so it's not a big chore, but he'll cut that limb off and let it fall to the ground and they'll trample it in. It'll be a source of soil carbon and it will also kind of help keep the cows away from the stem base a little bit so there's less impact on the root systems. And um, we have some evidence, it's not, <clears throat> not conclusive, but we have some evidence here from some other work that we're doing that tannins uh, in forages can um, negate some of the effects of fescue toxins. And so his cattle are on essentially 100% toxic tall fescue. And he said they really relish these leaves with tannins in them, uh, and, and particularly in the summertime when that stuff is actively growing. OK, thank you. So the next question uh, is by uh, Mr. Uh, Herm Hermson. So you mentioned that you have seen greater overhaul uh, plant biomass productivity when integrating trees with for with forages. Has research been done evaluated, evaluating the uh, how a diverse uh, forage stand affects biomass uh, production versus a single a monoculture forage stand? Yeah, so that's a, maybe a little bit outside the context of civil pasture per se, but the answer is yes, greater diversity in general is associated with higher productivity. You've got different root architectures, you have different phenology, so plants that are growing at different times and taking advantage of the resources. Uh, when you have a stress event and you have one species and it's uh, sensitive to that stress, then the whole system is shut down, whereas if you have multiple species with different sensitivities, um, you know, let's say alfalfa or chicory with deep root systems can capture water um, when other forage species cannot. So, so to answer your question very briefly, yes, diversity is a good thing. Okay. Uh, and then Dr. Halloran just mentioned that uh, nitrogen fixation is especially uh, beneficial for C3 forages uh, at, at that time. Well, it's it's beneficial for C4s as well, certainly. Mm -hmm. uh, the C4s are more nitrogen use efficient, but if you looked at you know Bermuda grass uh, or other C4 species, they like nitrogen. And, and they will be quite productive with it. I mean, we, we, we have a whole bunch of research just on how much and when to apply nitrogen fertilize, uh, fertilizers to uh, Bermuda grass, hay fields, and pastures. Um, so it's not just the C3s uh, that, that like nitrogen. Mm -hmm. 
Then uh, we have one more question. So uh, Mrs. Mrs. Cobkerson is saying, uh, I've read that honey uh, locust doesn't fix as much nitrogen as uh, black locust. Is that true? Uh, I'm, what doesn't fix as much nitrogen as black locust? Honey locust. Oh, that probably is true. Um, honey locust is, a, is an intriguing plant. Uh, and I haven't read about this lately, but the last reading I did on this, um, there was some suggestion that it's a it's a more primitive legume. It does not nodulate. And so but but it has high levels of nitrogen beyond what you might expect. Uh, and And so, you know, where's that nitrogen coming from? It, are there? Uh, microbial root associations that we're just not aware of. And, and again, I don't know where the research stands on that at this point, but uh, yes, it does not nodulate, probably does not fix as much nitrogen. But one of the things we observe is that we have high levels of legume productivity, oftentimes in our honey locust stands. So it will accommodate um, species like red clover. And um, so, so that's not been, I mean, we're, we're, we're looking at these systems primarily from their productivity, animal performance, forage production. We do look at some composition stuff. Um, and, and so, but we haven't gone deep into, you know, nitrogen fixation by these different trees, uh, but that does not, you know, that, and we don't have a way to compare at this point, say black locust with honey locust, but, but you're generally right. I'd say that the honey locust would, we would anticipate would have lower levels of nitrogen fixation. Okay, thank you. Uh, at this point, uh, we're just gonna uh, ask you if you have a question to unmute yourself and ask. Does anybody have any questions? Well, so, so I got a question. Mm -hmm. Is this crazy? Does anybody want trees in pastures? And I realize I may have, could have done a better job thinking about this in a South Carolina or Southern coastal plain context, but. No, you did a good job, Dr. Fife. Well, well, well. Very useful information. Uh, you know, I, I see Mr. Noble, he kind of grinned when I said this is crazy. And I, I'm not sure whether that's a grin of like, yeah, I'm not going to admit it out loud or, <laughs> or what that means. But, uh, you, you know, I, I've spent a career on this, essentially. Uh, maybe I was crazy, I, but I, I think that it has real potential. The issue, again, is how do we get producers to manage? Mm -hmm. And uh, Dr. Fike, just before I let you go, I just wanted to ask you to touch a little more in a couple of topics, if you don't uh, mind. Oh, okay. I'll do, I'll do my best. So uh, I know you uh, have a lot of experience both on the like uh, working on research sites, but also uh, helping producers to get their uh, farms going and establishing mm -hmm. their uh, mm -hmm. their sites. So if you could just let us know like uh, some of the major considerations if I'm wanting to establish a uh, yeah, that yeah. I should take in consideration. Yeah, you know I. <laughs> Right. I'm, I was pulling slides from two or three different slide sets today, and Liliana and I, I'm sorry, I had some stuff about considerations, um, and and they they didn't make it in, and that's just an oversight on my part. So, you, you know, the first question is, what are your circumstances? What are your motivations? What are your goals? You know, and, and I would say this, too, for those of you who are producers, you're thinking, well, this guy's nuts, but, you know, I could try some of this. One of my a uh, friend says, take the 10 tree challenge, you know, can you take a couple of species or whatever you think you're interested in and plant about 10 trees of them. Don't try to go out and plant 10 acres and watch the whole thing fail. Just go plant 10 trees and see if you can make them work or not. What works, what doesn't work. And think about your system. Um, are you in a deep sand? Or are you on a red clay? Where, um, where are you going to be growing these trees? What trees are adapted to your site? What livestock are you trying to produce? You know, I've got lots of people that want to do goats and, you know, that's great. But if you're going to do goats, then you either need to think about a tree that they don't really have any particular preference for, 
or you need to think about, well, I may need to be a little more aggressive at implementing protection, right? You know, I mean, fencing might work, but I may even have to build, a, you know, put a cage around them, something like that. Honey, uh, let me, a quick story on honey locust trees. They were planted in 1995. And at the time, they planted trees eight feet apart. And every fifth tree was a grafted tree that produces a pod that's got lots of sugar in it. And my colleague that got me into this thing said the deer went to every one of those grafts and girdled the tree. The deer could tell that was a high sugar tree and they left the, the common types alone. And so, you know, you, you got to think about, is this tree going to be palatable or not? And if so, how do I protect it? Uh, if you're going back into a pasture system, uh, you know, you, you've got to think about reducing the competition there. Um, so, you know, some sort of uh, herbicide treatment or, you know, or uh, mulch or both, that sort of thing. Um, there are all these, these things that you want. Somebody said that, uh, you know, this gives them some ideas for their pecans and loblollies. Yeah, and, you know, both very different types of trees are going to take different types of management, but the pecan silver pasture system is certainly doable. And you'll see, you know, in the Missouri places like that, they're doing more uh, black walnut, but the pecan systems are, are certainly possible. Um, so again, I can't, I can't be prescriptive, but you just have to think about how do these components go together and interact and what am I willing to do? What do I have time and energy to do in terms of tree establishment? Um, one thing, you know, many of you may think about planting several acres and you might have a commercial operator to do that. Uh, it's important, I think, to develop something of an aftercare program where they come back in and or you have somebody that's coming back in to look at those trees, see if they're healthy, you know, living kind of if if there's evidence of uh, animal damage, you need to get on that quickly. And so, I mean, there's a... I, kind of mixing pieces here there's an aftercare part where you know a commercial operator could come in and help keep those trees going you know re uh, stake stuff if it needs to be or remove weeds or that sort of thing um, but then there's your job too which would be to look at these on a regular basis and make sure that it, you're not suffering from wildlife damage or that you know you run the cattle in make sure that the cattle are not causing problems you don't want to just say, well, they'll be all right, and I'll take a look at them, you know, next month, and by that time, it's a, it's a, it's a problem. So, sorry, I'm not really answering the question. I'm saying you've got to, you got to kind of work through some of those uh, details on your own for the resources you have, the and the and the things that the outcomes that you want. I will say this as well. Uh, NRCS is um, highly supportive, I think, and not in all states, but uh, there seems to be a growing uh, interest in seeing these systems get implemented. Um, and you may or may not have a good, I shouldn't say good, a knowledgeable technical service provider. Uh, but there are a lot of resources financially out there, and there's growing uh, resources in terms of uh, examples of how people are doing this successfully. Sure, thank you. So, uh, Mr. Wade is asking, is there any research regarding using civil pasture and long leaf uh, pine restoration? Uh, I, I haven't seen that with long leaf pine um, restoration. Certainly would be possible, I think. Uh, the pines are, you know, some people don't want to fool with long leaf because of, you know, they, they're kind of variable coming out of the grass stage. And so it may take a little bit longer to get them uh, up. Um, but again, I think you could do that. You could certainly, and, and I've, I don't know if it's, it, I don't remember if it was long leaf or slash or uh, which species exactly, but I, you know, I have some, some example imagery from some, somebody had given me, I think it was actually long leaf. Um, so I think that's the, the bottom line is, I think that's very doable. Uh, it may take a different kind of time frame or a different set of uh, inputs than say, if you're planting loblolly, which some of my forester friends tell me will grow in a parking lot. Sure. So the next question is, uh, any issues with soil pH adjacent to the trees? Soil pH, what, Leone? Next, next to the trees. 
um, barrier uh, on the adjacent. Uh, my, you know, my uh, accent. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and forgive <laughs> me, my ears don't always catch it exactly. So, I so, know. so, so, right he, next to the trees. One, one of the things that, you know, it's been interesting to me, we, we plant trees and we've got different demonstration sites. And sometimes you, you got a site that looks kind of rough. Uh, for us, rough might be low pH, low phosphorus. Uh, and blackberries and that kind of stuff will show up there. But, you know, sometimes, um, we get a lot of broom sedge. And so, you know, I, I don't encourage you to improve the pasture before you get the tree planted if you're in that kind of situation. Because those low P, uh, low pH systems or, or soil, soil conditions are, you know, oftentimes not very bad for many of the tree species that you might plant. And uh, if you've got lots of broom sedge that's growing up around that tree, then, you know, that's, that's a buffer you know the deer don't want to put their head through that stuff so that can be protective um buck holsinger i've mentioned him two or three times in his talk earlier this week he said that he's now planting uh trees black locust in particular back into switchgrass fields and, and he doesn't want to fool with tubes anymore so that gives him some cover and protection for those uh seedling trees the but the switchgrass the native grasses are well adapted to you know low soil pH. If you've got higher uh, nutrient concentrations in soil, uh, then you create environment or conditions that are more um, conducive for cool season or, or warm season forages for that matter. And that just means there's the potential for more competition. So if you don't have a high fertility site and you want to create silvopasture there, that's fine. Get the trees up and then you know come back and do the renovation in the alleys or interspaces for your for your forage productions kind of that would be my general recommendation sure and uh the other point that i wanted to uh just um maybe if you have some examples to mention something uh is more like on the ecosystem benefits that we can get with civil pasture uh systems because i think this is one of the things that uh a lot of people are looking to increasing, enhancing sustainability on their uh, farms nowadays. So like, do you want to just mention something? Right, right, right. Well, and I, and I, I didn't want to step on Bruno's toes here, but, you know, I will just say that, you know, these systems offer the opportunity to capture carbon, uh, to so support greater biodiversity within the soil, um, you know, when we get out and work within the civil pasture, and I have graduate students out there working, you know, in these systems, and they're like, we'll work in the civil pasture, you can do the stuff out in the open. You know, and there's a benefit to the human being interacting in that space, quite frankly, and I, and, and I know people that are like, uh, you know, if I can manage in these systems, that's fantastic. Um, and of course, you know, maybe where you are, grassland birds are a real issue. And so, you know, I don't say we have to put civil pasture on every acre uh, because grassland birds need open sites. They don't need trees around them. Uh, but we, at the same time, you know, we do see lots of bird species that we wouldn't see in our open systems. Um, and, and, you know, our lands are kind of cut up. They're not necessarily... Uh, the, the best suited for grassland birds, at least where I'm doing some of my research. So I don't feel like I'm hurting them, but I'm providing opportunity for, for other species. Um, yeah, so I mentioned carbon. You know, it's possible that those healthier or and uh, more comfortable animals are producing a, a better quality uh, product. We haven't measured that at, at this point. Um, and, you know, there's, there may even be the potential benefits relative to sometimes when animals are more heat stressed, I think they can have higher methane emissions. So, you know, we don't have all the data to say one way or, or another on that. Um, but we do think of those as uh, potential benefits. Uh, certainly, we uh, have a lot of, um, historically have done a lot of riparian buffer plantings with trees. And so in this kind of context, civil pasture may be, you know, a way to manage a riparian buffer. If those trees are out in leaf and you've got a big storm coming, uh, you are going to slow those raindrops and you can slow uh, runoff to the, you know, to the ecosystem. Um, 
and and two, you know, if you get into a big bad drought, I mean, I'm I'm older than most of you here. Uh, I remember in '93 there was uh, excuse me, '93 was a big flood in the Midwest. There was a big drought in the early '90s, I think. And you know, there used to be a lot of news stories at that time of producers that were cutting sycamore and poplar and cottonwood and things like that to feed their cattle. So a lot of these trees, you know, can buffer the system from a temperature, uh, from a moisture standpoint, but they also can buffer the system in terms of feed resources when you get into extreme weather. Uh, I didn't talk so much about cold. It's not something we worry about much in the Southeast, uh, but there's a lot of energy lost by animals you know, that are out in an open field dealing with cold temperatures and wet weather and wind. And so you could plant trees, not maybe so much as civil pasture, but as shelter belts, uh, to, to give them some protection from the elements that way. And that has a very high energy sparing effect. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Fife. We really appreciate uh, all the information that you shared with us.